So, uh, good morning. It's a Thursday, January 12, 2023. It's 1045. This is the second half of our morning session. And we are joined by uh, Secretary Moore. And the next, uh, we have two more topics to work on today. They, they are very much related. Um, we're we're going to kick off with administration plans to meet the greenhouse gas reduction requirements under 10 VSA 578 in the Global Warming Solutions Act. So we'll be looking at transportation, thermal, and agriculture. Um, and then we're, uh, we'll follow up with looking back at last year's uh, parts. Uh, we will look back at last year's um, uh, veto on 8715, which was the, the clean heat standard, um, which addresses, was an attempt on the part of the legislature to address the uh, emissions related to thermal flows. Uh, and then as time allows, we also have S5, which is already introduced, uh, significantly edited compared to last year's bill. I didn't ask you to prepare a response to that, and then we will schedule time for that if you want make comments on S5, you're certainly welcome, but we can ask the agency to prepare on S5. We'll be we doing that in So with that, uh, uh, good morning again, good morning. Secretary Moore. Uh, good morning, Julie Moore, uh, Secretary of Natural Resources, and I'm joined by Ed McNamara, who's the agency's general counsel. Uh, I did prepare a presentation for the first half of this conversation, which really gets at Sort of the, the efforts underway to meet the greenhouse gas emissions reduction requirements of the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, but before digging into the how, uh, I thought it might be helpful for the committee to talk a little bit about the what and just make sure we have a shared understanding of the magnitude of the work that's required. Uh, the information that's contained in this presentation is drawn largely from the Vermont Pathways Analysis Report uh, 2.0, which was completed in February of last year. So after uh, the Climate Action Plan was adopted, we had had benefit of the, the 1.0 version of the Pathways Analysis as we finalized the Climate Action, as the Climate Council finalized the Climate Action Plan. Um, but there were some additional uh, changes and um, considerations that we had asked the consultant to continue to work on. Uh, so starting with the, the transportation sector, and I'm going to address each of the three sectors you had identified in um, your note, Senator Bray. So uh, the pathways analysis uses 2018 as a baseline. Um, that's in part because, as you may recall, the Global Warming Solutions Act measures progress, um, sometimes from 1990, sometimes from 2005. Uh, and it becomes really complicated to sort of have an apples to apples comparison for 2025, 2030, and 2050. Um, so the Pathways Report uses this convention of generally comparing to 2018. I say that you'll see agriculture has a 2020 baseline, um, but it's consistent throughout, and that is also um, with the support agreement of the Climate Council. Uh, so in order to reach the requirements of the Global Warming Solutions Act, there needs to be an 11% reduction from the transportation sector by 2025, more than a 30% reduction by 2031, and an 88% reduction by 2050. Uh, the way we're going to achieve those reductions is primarily through expanding numbers of electric vehicles. Um, there are other smaller opportunities that are identified in the Pathways Report. Opportunities may be a bit of a misnomer. This is an a, a, this is not an actually an a la carte menu. That all of these things have to occur in order to achieve uh, the mandated reductions. But those other pieces are increasing fuel economy, um, increasing use of biofuels in a low carbon fuel standard, and I will highlight that in a couple of different places. I know that that's an area of interest in the way S5 is being drafted. Um, and biofuels do play a fairly significant role um, in at least what's been modeled as, as the, the best approach to reducing our emissions. Uh, lowering vehicle miles traveled and then not losing sight of the fact that there are non-road vehicles that also uh, currently are filled with fossil fuels. But those tend to be smaller pieces. Uh, the next slide just gives a, a sense of the numbers <laughs> that need to happen here. Uh, I have had someone take a look at my uh, presentation this morning and they did let me know 
we actually have more current information about the number of electric vehicles registered in Vermont than what was reflected in my note at the bottom of that table. It's now about 7,500 uh, EVs that have been registered in Vermont, which is 1.7% of all registered vehicles in the state. Um, so that's a, a significant jump over the last 18 months, from which is what my data was reflective of previously with that just under 5,000, uh, but still got we've got quite a way to go, ways to go to get to 27,000 in 2025, but probably more to the point to reach 126,000 in 2030. Um, one of the, the pieces, and I'll talk about this a bit more uh, later in my presentation, is, is the adopt, Vermont's adoption of the Advanced Clean Car 2 and Clean Truck Standards, or the California Standards, as they're sometimes referred to. Um, that maximizes our anticipated delivery of electric vehicles into the state of Vermont. I, I think there's a general sense um, that there will not be an ability to sort of over comply and receive more vehicles than what we would be allotted under the California standards. And these numbers may be challenging to achieve um, as, as a result. Um, moving on to the thermal and building space. Um, you can see that the, the early um, decreases in the thermal and building space are more significant uh, than they were in the transportation space with looking at 20, a 27% reduction by 2025, but again, aiming for that 88% reduction by 2050, which is where we sort of offer the, the Vermont economy has been decarbonized. Um, when it comes to thermal and building sector emissions, the primary drivers of that are going to be weatherization, increased use of heat pumps, both for space heating, but also for hot water. Um, and then again, increasing use of biofuels and uh, advanced wood heat. And in fact, wood heat and biofuels under the pathways analysis are projected to serve about 20% of the residential energy demand in 2050. Um, and expanded use of biofuels is really integral um, from those experts' opinions of our ability to reduce emissions from the industrial sector that is included in this thermal and building sector. Um, so again, just giving a sense for the, the magnitude of the work that needs to occur and a little bit of perspective. Um, by 2025, we would need to weatherize about 69,000 homes to achieve these reductions and 120,000 homes by 2030. Uh, we also need to dramatically increase the number of heat pumps and heat pump water heaters that have been installed in the state. For perspective, um, for the last five years for which data is available, which is the period 2015 to 2020, um, Vermonters installed about 30,000 heat pumps and 13,000 heat pump water heaters. So um, getting to 96,000 and 63,000 respectively over the next five year increment is a, a significant increase in the magnitude of what needs to be accomplished. Uh, similarly, we have a, a challenging road that lies ahead when it comes to weatherization. Um, this is, is the sort of projections in terms of what's needed uh, for a while, we had drawn this as a straight line. This is actually one of the changes we went back to the uh, consultants and asked them to change in the pathways report saying, essentially, this works out to about 10,000 homes a year. And we, ca we can't possibly go from the 2,000 homes a year we have done historically to 10,000 homes a year with the drop of a hat. So this intends to show that ramp up over time. Um, where we're doing about 2,500 homes this year, uh, that jumps to 3,500 homes next year. But ultimately, you can see in the out years, it requires us to be looking at weatherizing um, upwards of 20,000 homes a year. Uh, this curve lasts out to 2030, but I don't want you to think the work stops there. Ultimately, about three quarters of Vermont's housing units will need weatherization services. So we've got 243,000 um, by the time we hit 2050. So that, that work absolutely continues um, in the out years and sort of continues at pace. The final of the three sectors you asked me to speak to, Senator Bray, was the agricultural sector. This is a, a smaller piece. You know, transportation is about 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions. I'm going to look to Ed. Uh, building and thermal is mid 30s, and I think agriculture is maybe 15. Okay, so agriculture is much smaller um, 
than the than transportation and the building thermal piece. Um, and the, the reductions are, are somewhat smaller in part because this is a, a more challenging space in which to achieve them. Um, the, the tools we have at our disposal are alternative feed practices and feed additives that can help reduce methane production in dairy and beef cattle. Uh, best practices for manure management, and that often takes the form of waste digesters, on-farm waste digesters that are able to capture that gas, and expanded soil sequestration practices. I uh, flag those are sort of near and dear to my heart because those oftentimes are the exact same practices we are promoting from a water quality perspective. Um, and so just a, a sense for the, the level of, of reduction that we believe is achievable. Um, the challenge here is that most of the research that's available to us right now when it comes to agriculture is national data. Um, and there have been significant concerns raised by the Agency of Agriculture and some of their partners um, that we really need some Vermont specific information to know if this is practical or real. Um, and this includes both thinking about current emissions from the ag sector, the scope and pace of the potential reductions and the costs associated with it. Um, and they feel, and I think rightly so, that these national data sets may not be uh, particularly accurate when it comes to Vermont agriculture. I don't usually have visual aids, but I just have to shrink this adding in as an independent local greenhouse gas emissions going up in for the county. There's a pretty active group in Addison County uh, trying to get into much more granular data and so I don't know if you all have seen that information yet, but I just want to call it out while we're passing. And for us being an agricultural county, uh, it's related to agriculture. It's no reason to see your article attribute the, uh, the most significant reason for it's going uh, well, of, of the different sectors that we're talking about, it was agriculture was the, the, the leading cause for Addison County. So, but we can, you know, actually, I thought it's when the time, when we have the time to have those folks in, it's actually uh, uh, Asa Hopkins' father has, lives in Madison County, so he's of the same sort of uh, sharp mind to the issue that his son did at the department. Well, and Richard has been an active participant in the Science and Data Subcommittee at the Climate Council, which I'm also a member of, and really um, provided, provided review and comment on the Pathways Report and some of the other technical deliverables that I'll, I'll mention in the, the next okay. section of my, my overview here. Um, so then really turning to you, you'd asked kind of what the administration's plan was and so wanted to talk through the, the work that is ongoing or has been recently completed or ongoing, um, which hopefully helps answer that question. So since the, uh, the climate action plan was adopted in December of 2021, so uh, a little over a year, um, here are the things, here's what we've been up to. Uh, we established the Climate Action Office in ANR um, and did convene an, an initial meeting of the Interagency Climate Advisory Council. So this is this, um, as I mentioned earlier, in talk, providing the agency overview, uh, creating this, this hub to bring together and coordinate uh, intergovernmental efforts. We did complete rulemaking to adopt the California Advanced Clean Cars Regulations, the Clean Truck Regulations, also the Heavy Duty Knox Omnibus Rule and the Phase Two Greenhouse Gas Rule for trucks and trailers. Those are uh, maybe less talked about, but uh, put us on the road to reducing emissions associated with medium and heavy duty trucks, in addition to the work with um, light duty vehicles that will be accomplished under ACC2 and ACT. Um, those rules were filed with the Secretary of State in December, um, and in fact, we had to, to wait a few days having received LCAR's approval so that California could file their rules first. So we really um, moved aggressively in that space, and I think that will pay enormous dividends in our overall effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, as we also talked a little bit about this morning, the administration has been working to deploy nearly $250 million in federal ARPA funds and state one-time monies and climate action. And I've listed off um, the, the primary areas of investment. It is not 
that is maybe not uh, exhaustive. And also if there's interest in details, many of these are being run out of other agencies of state government and would be probably uh, serve this committee well to hear directly from the agencies administering those programs. Um, but really significant investments, chief among them is an $80 million um, investment in, in weatherization uh, that should be able to help us weatherize, I think, 8,000 additional homes over the next uh, four years. The administration has also been looking at the fact that there are a lot of competitive funding opportunities that are currently either out or coming soon um, in response to the IIJA and the IRA. Um, many state agencies are going to be eligible applicants for these various funding solicitations. ANR is looking at some I know the Department of Public Service is looking at some, uh, the Agency of Transportation is looking at some, and that may not be an exhaustive list. I think the other piece to keep in mind here is that there are other eligible uh, applicants to many of these funding pools, um, including utilities, uh, but also know that, for example, um, Vermont Housing Finance Administration, working with VITA and the Vermont Municipal Bond Bank is looking at making a proposal for green bank funding that would be coming from EPA uh, that could help with the costs of a number of different residential uh, climate investments. Sure. Um, since we'll have some people uh, listening who won't know IIJA and um, IRA, can you just very briefly say what those are? Sure. So IIJA is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, sometimes we also refer to it interchangeably as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Uh, but that was a package passed by Congress in, I believe, March of what? Uh, must have been 22. No, ARPA was 21. Um, and this is provides um, sort of core infrastructure funding through existing federal programs is the bulk of the money under IIJA. So that is money coming to the Agency of Natural Resources for drinking water system and wastewater system improvements, as well as going to the Agency of Transportation to help implement their federal highway transportation plan. That said, it does have a number of smaller um, funding streams, including money going to the Department of Public Service, money coming to ANR to work on brownfields and hazardous waste sites, um, as well as some competitive funding opportunities, many of which are in the transportation space. I believe Secretary Flynn told me he, that they've identified more than 20 competitive funding opportunities under IIJA that they may be eligible for. The second of those is the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, that was obviously passed late last year. Um, and we there, there's probably more we don't know than we do know at this point. It is an enormous package of programs. Uh, it includes tax incentives, direct appropriations to states, as well as competitive grant opportunities. Uh, some of the competitive grant opportunities are significant, um, and the federal funding agencies at this point are developing guidance uh, that will tell us exactly sort of how to apply and who is likely to be a successful applicant. We have uh, responded to a number of different requests for information that have come out of these federal funding agencies, hoping they'll tailor the program somewhat in a way that would be beneficial to Vermont. Uh, clearly, we're not alone in providing that kind of input and advice. Um, and we expect that the, the final guidance for many of these programs will roll out over the next several months. There, there are a couple in particular we've been tracking through EPA where they've told us mid-February, um, but not all of them are on exactly the same time. Um, on some of these other, like uh, the ARPA money, for instance, I think it was Treasury that was the uh, single point that articulated what money could be used for or not used for. Is Treasury still playing that role for these other major grants like IIJA and IRA, or do you have to chase down individual agencies? It, it is more at the individual agency level, and it won't be nearly as flexible as the ARPA dollars we receive. So in broad strokes, ARPA money could be invested in programs that benefited low-income Vermonters, in programs that benefited what they had termed impacted industries, so in industries that, that suffered disproportionate losses during COVID um, and water infrastructure programs that sort of fell under what we work we would traditionally do anyway. 
Um, beyond that, there was really broad flexibility in, in how each state chose to deploy those dollars. We won't have that same level of flexibility here. Uh, it will be fairly prescriptive and also uh, ARPA money came as what I would call formula funding where we were just told how, how much dollars we would receive and then had the opportunity to program it into those areas. Uh, these, these by and large are dominated by competitive grant opportunities. Once you get past the base funding coming to ANR for drinking water and wastewater work and to the transportation agency for their highway program. Um, Next is, is I just want to talk a little bit about the, the ongoing work uh, and largely within the, the Agency of Natural Resources to um, kind of build out the data and um, information we need to both inform ongoing work related to climate action, but also uh, what will be the next generation of the climate action plan. Um, so we've over the last year plus we've completed two significant analyses. One is the pathways analysis that was the basis for the first half of my report. Um, we also completed a mitigation cost curve life cycle analysis. So this is helping us be able to look at both upfront costs and then lifetime savings of mitigation measures. We are in the process of developing a municipal toolkit for Vermont municipalities. This was an explicit requirement of the Global Warming Solutions Act and will include what we're calling a municipal vulnerability index to identify communities that are, are likely to be at greatest risk um, of effects from climate change. That has been a, a significant body of work we have had um, really nice support from the University of Vermont, in particular, Dr. Leslie Ann Dupigny Giroux um, and some of her students in, in doing this work and building some mapping tools, and look forward to having that uh, a, a first version of that ready by this summer. Uh, we also have a number of other um, projects that are that are underway. Uh, we are doing a life cycle analysis of energy use. Um, so this is looking at from sort of cradle to grave uh, uh, greenhouse or the environmental impacts associated with different types of energy. Uh, we are in the throes of an evaluation of building in thermal decarbonization policy options. Um, this is a, a quantitative evaluation of policy options, as well as trying to gather some cost information. I can talk about that a little bit more, but really trying to answer the questions the governor raised in his veto message. Um, we have a specific project around agricultural sector emissions and sequestration, and this is getting that Vermont specific information. We received a, a grant from the US Climate Alliance to help support our work in this space. Um, and then VTRANS is developing what they're terming a carbon reduction strategy, and that's uh, going to be ultimately help inform how they invest um, through their capital program in transportation programs in a way that helps reduce emissions. And that's work that should be completed, my understanding is, by the end of the year. Um, and then finally, almost finally, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we've done a lot of work around public engagement and outreach and climate action, building relationships, uh, partnering with the environmental justice unit that I talked about briefly this morning that is, is being spun up within the agency. Uh, maybe the best example of this is how we engaged around the clean car and clean truck rules. Uh, as you may know, our choice in the clean car and clean truck rules is either adopt California's rules or adopt the federal rules. And there's there's no other choices available. So it felt a little disingenuous to go out to the public with a set of rules and ask for comments on them when in reality it's a yes no question. Uh, so instead, uh, we changed our approach. And frankly, it was in, in response also to input we received from the Just Transitions Committee as part of the development of the Climate Action Plan and went out to the public and said, this is the proposal. It would transition. It will transition Vermont to all new vehicle sales in 2035 will be electric vehicles. What, what does it, what is needed for that to be successful and receive feedback? A lot of it was about charging infrastructure. Um, some of it was about incentives and financial supports. Some of it was about wiring in individuals homes that they don't believe is capable of supporting electric vehicles. But that kind of input 
um, is probably, I'm going to assume, more meaningful to the people providing it and frankly more helpful to us at this point. Um, and I, this reflects what I hope will be a trend going forward in, in how we seek to engage the public, not just in the technical details of the rules, but the practical effects um, of our work. So just add, um, I apologize, can I just add also that agency staff worked very closely with the Department of Public Service, especially on the questions related to char charging infrastructure incentives, yeah. also worked with the Agency of Transportation, Department of Motor Vehicles. Okay. So even though the agency was tasked with the rule, recognizing that it's actually fairly broad in impact, and so reaching out to all the affected agencies. And can you just introduce yourself for the record? Oh, my apologies. Um, Ed McNamara, General Counsel for Agency of Natural Resources. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. so, uh, you've worked hard on trying to move electric vehicles. This being a fast growing segment of our driving. And I own an electric vehicle, so I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, I. I I've been keeping some personal records just driving around uh, the, the new cars and the new truck light trucks that I see on the road. And apparently the, the four door, four wheel drive uh, light pickup truck is the biggest selling segment of our population and growing and growing and growing. And uh, then I look at the record of the number that 73% of the vehicles registered in this state are registered as used cars. Correct. What is your recommendation, your agency's recommendation to tackle and prevent the huge amount of used gas vehicles, the used gas guzzling vehicles that will be sitting on the used car lots in four, five, or six, or seven years when their warranties run out because poor people buy their vehicles on used car lots. And that's one question. The other one is, um, what is the difference in gas mileage between driving a, uh, just stick with the man caves here, the, the four wheel drive pickups at 65 miles an hour and 80 miles an hour. How many more gallons do they use per mile when they're driving 15 miles above the legal speed limit? And why is that not an area for reducing unnecessary uh, emissions? <clears throat> so I'll start with your second question because it's a bit easier in that I, I don't know. Uh, we can <laughs> certainly look, look into that. I know that obviously at greater speed the vehicle efficiency decreases um i you know and, and to my knowledge that speed enforcement is not anything that was identified in the climate action plan as a strategy i think we'll probably run smack up against the the capacity of the vermont state police frankly at this point to, to help with such a policy initiative they're down 50 troopers i believe at the moment and i don't know that that would be a priority for that organization um, but we can make a note of the vehicle. We set the priorities for that organization. <clears throat> yeah. Well, to that end, um, I have administrative discretions. Um, and then they, to answer your your other question, I I think that that's got to be an ongoing area of focus and attention. I'm well aware that three quarters of the cars registered cars and trucks registered in Vermont are are used vehicles. Part of it is we need more used EVs to be in the mix on the lots. Um, it is difficult to find those and they are uh, spendy right now. Um, and so incentive programs like Replace Your Ride and Mileage Smart are really important components, but they are components that only work if vehicles are available for purchase. And I think that is currently the barrier um, many folks are seeing when they, they look for a used EV. So it, it's an ongoing area um, of discussion and interest and certainly a consideration. Uh, that said, the entire 
approach of adopting the California clean car and clean truck standards is a market-based approach. The manufacturers are the ones that are required to comply, not Vermonters. And if we're gonna take a different approach and uh, limit the vehicle choices available to Vermonters, that I think would be direction we would need from this body. Okay. So if we were to charge, put a uh, <laughs> extra fee on someone who goes out and buys a new gas guzzler, that, that would have to come from us. What's the, uh, what's your recommendation? What's my recommendation in terms of whether that would be a policy initiative from the legislature? Well, if we are going to make gas guzzlers more expensive to buy so that less of them will be purchased and show up at used car lots, how would you, would the agency recommend we craft such a global warming solution? So there are certainly, there's work that's been done to look at fee bait programs that exist in other jurisdictions where there is a fee assessed on a, a car that has an efficiency less than the sort of average of the fleet and it's um, returned, it's a, a cost neutral, or not cost neutral, Revenue neutral, maybe because the, the money is then returned to users who purchase more efficient vehicles. Um, we can look at something like that. I think the challenge in terms of the operating environment we're currently in is that there are not necessarily sufficient electric vehicles available. I wasn't talking about electric vehicles, I was talking about fossil fuel vehicles. It, we, we have not moved or discussed any policy initiatives in that space. They burn a lot of fossil fuels. Understood. And you have a transportation <laughs> recommendation about reducing fossil fuel burning. Could you please make a recommendation? I can get back to you with that. And same, on the same time, make a recommendation or at least share with us the numbers of if we enforce speed limits. Mm -hmm. I think speed limits went down to 55 miles an hour during the energy crisis of the late uh, 70s, mid 70s. Okay. Um, so I don't know if you were, uh, finished your last slide there. I just, uh, on the last slide, talking about the, the work that, that's currently underway, um, specifically related to the, the thermal sector. Um, and this is, is a little bit broader than that as well. Um, obviously, one of the core requirements of the Global Warming Solutions Act is this long-term ability to measure and assess progress. Uh, we've taken some, we're taking some steps to look at our greenhouse gas emissions inventory and forecast. As you may recall, when we produced the 2018 inventory in 2021, uh, we ran into some real challenges with how we had been modeling uh, transportation related emissions. The model had sort of conked out and we needed to go a different route. Um, there are other opportunities to improve the accuracy of this and to create sort of a standing process going forward, knowing that the inventory is the uh, basis for any legal cause of action. We've also been working with sister agencies and departments to better understand available information on the type and volume of fossil fuel deliveries into Vermont um, and identify changes needed to ensure timely, accurate data. This work is important to the greenhouse gas emissions inventory. Uh, I think it's also foundational to any type of clean heat standard. And the fact of the matter is there's a, a surprising amount of stuff we don't know as we began to dig into that. And then we've been developing and uh, released an RFP for um, the building sector. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is the <laughs> developing. We are finishing development of an RFP um, for the, what I call the measuring and assessing progress tool um, to look at the, that government-wide uh, tracking by, in my mind's eye, it looks not unlike our clean annual clean water performance report, but will provide that kind of comprehensive assessment of our progress towards uh, achieving the requirements of the global warming solutions. Um, I'm very mindful of the time, but I want to also be able to get to the uh, it's a 15 discussion. Uh, but a high level question for these measures is do you know where, so it lays out increments for each of the 
percentage of reduction for each of the three sectors. Do you know where we are currently compared to those targets? You know, for instance, on thermal, it's 27 by 2025 or 48 by 2030. Do you know what we've achieved for reductions to date? And so we have something to measure it with. Ish. Uh, that's the greenhouse gas emissions inventory. It generally has an 18 to 24 month lag, um, in part because we're relying on national data sets that then get sort of um, <clears throat> disaggregated and, and uh, provided to states. So Ed has been working with the, the team to prepare our last inventory, and it was 2018. I think we are intending to release the 2019 and 2020 and maybe 2021 inventory all at the same time. I don't know if we've gotten the final data for 2021. So we're not current and we can't be current um, because the data that's available right. to us is for sure. Do um, you know when we'll get that data? I mean, I'm just trying to figure out where it's helpful to have, you know, an apples to apples comparison with um, normalizing around dates. So we don't have to reference 2005, 1990, et cetera. But um, um, I think the committee is also interested to say, relative to these targets that you've recalibrated, where are we? Right. So we should have the answers for 2019 and 2020 um, in the next couple of months here, I think. I think the idea is sometime in the summer. Um, different data sets also come in at different times. So there might be something more complete for transportation, but heating is probably going to take longer than transportation. Data sources, but having the complete inventory won't be ready until late in December. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, let's follow up offline on that to just say, even though there's a lag, and even though we won't bring up uh 2021 till the summer which um won't be that helpful to us as a committee but uh that's just a, i get it it's a time um i think we'd like to circle back and at least use the most recently available data to help us see where we are in progress relative to these recalibrated targets you've laid out that year so, um, are there any committee questions before we switch over to 7.5 center white Thank you, Chair Bray. I guess I'm just a mildly confused, which is not uncommon. What is the plan to meet the goals? Because I, and perhaps I misunderstood the goal of today, but what I'm hearing is a lot of research analysis, but not necessarily then meeting those goals. So uh, I think it's going to depend on, in some ways, the direction from this body. The Climate Action Plan did not contemplate a lot of regulation by state <clears throat> agencies. It contemplated incentive-based and policy-based programs um, that would need to come in from the General Assembly. And happy to, well, not today, but <laughs> in general, happy to, to walk through the, the types of, of recommendations. Um, but the the, the sole rulemaking requirement, which is the immediate steps um, that state government was required to take, uh, was related to the clean car. Okay. And I think also, I'm so understanding that. what you're explaining. Can I also just add, my understanding is the Director of the Climate Action Office um, will be testifying here, I believe, yes. on the Climate Action Plan, and that does get to what are the actual recommendations in all of the different sectors? Okay, so we can expect from the Climate Action Office a plan that you're going to propose to meet this these is, goals. This is the Climate Action Plan that was developed pursuant to the Warming Solutions Act that was published in December of 21. There, there, and there is a, a requirement for the agency to have an independent plan to achieve the requirements of the Global Warming Solutions Act. All right. Uh, any other any questions on this part of the discussion? Um, then I think while I know you have 20 minutes, so we'll, we'll jump right in. Here is a copy for the community. So they don't have to remember our earlier presentation from Legislative Council. It's, it's the government's messages, so that we only have it 
in front of us. Um, and uh, yeah, so I want to emphasize that what we're because we're uh, keenly interested in making progress on our thermal reducing our thermal emissions. We're still working on, as you were saying, we if there's going to be an action plan in your uh, contemplating it coming originating in the legislature. Well, so here we are, perfect, perfect segue. Um, and as we uh, dig in in the coming weeks on Affordable Heat Act, as I said earlier, because there are similarities um, to 8715, um, we really want to make sure we understand two things. One is the concerns raised in the message, the real message, and then secondly, but uh, I don't know if uh, you've had subsequent conversations and that you can you know, update us any further. Things we should have in mind as we work on thermal sector greenhouse gas reduction. Yes. So I've uh, prepared a statement or a narrative, and feel free to interrupt me as we go along. Um, but I think it touches on all the points you just raised, Senator Gray. And I think it's important to start just, I would like to start with a level set that the, this conversation isn't, shouldn't be about, isn't about to my mind, whether or not climate action is important. It is. And we, and this we includes the governor, I think stand on common ground. Um, just like there's no doubt the sky is blue, the earth is round, the universe is expanding, our climate is changing. This, we're not debating that. Um, and as we move forward through the coming legislative session, I share and and like I think like you grappling with the sense of urgency to address climate change. But we also can't be blind to the real costs and practical challenges that lie ahead. Um, and to the extent you're ready to roll up your sleeves and do the hard work, I am absolutely a willing partner and have 600 people at the agency that would love nothing more. This means though hearing and taking seriously each other's concerns. And I have real concerns about the Affordable Heat Act, chiefly regarding the timeline that's laid out for this work and the limitations it creates to our ability to design data-informed durable policy. And I'll come back to that more um, in a few minutes. I don't know how many of you have read All We Can Save, which is a really wonderful anthology of essays and art by women writers who are working for climate action. And my favorite essay was written by Kate Marble in that book. Um, she's a research scientist at Columbia University and her piece was entitled A Handful of Dust. And I find I keep coming back to one line in particular as a touch point for my work around climate. She said, courage is the resolve to do well without assurance of a happy ending. But even in desperate times, there's a line between brave and foolish. We have to do something. It does not follow that we should simply settle for anything. Uh, the 2030 greenhouse gas reductions established in the Global Warming Solutions Act are the right goal. They're challenging. Some might even call them aspirational. Um, and they are driving significant investment and important actions. $250 million in federal funds, uh, the earth being an early adopter of the clean car and clean truck standards, chief among them. The 2030 reductions make clear what is needed in terms of medium term progress to achieve our ultimate long term 2050 goal of decarbonizing Vermont and meeting the Global Warming Solutions Act net zero requirement. At the same time, the 2030 reduction should not be used as a rationale to drive forward policy that isn't ready. I'm not here to argue about whether technically it may be possible to fulfill the 2030 requirements of the Global Warming Solutions Act. It may well be, but fulfilling these requirements will cause significant disruption, impact other priorities, come with real costs, and risk the support of those who are being asked to pay. A rough estimate of the cost to implement the measures identified in my earlier presentation to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the thermal sector just the thermal sector between now and 2030 exceeds $2 billion. The magnitude of this investment is on par with Vermont's commitment to clean water, but in the case, that implementation timeline was 20 years, four times more than the five years that'll be available to implement the clean heat standard with final rules planned for adoption in 2025. 
The level of investment required, though, isn't the only strong parallel I see between clean water and clean heat. In both cases, there's been significant and successful work to address what I would term point sources of pollution. Wastewater treatment plants in the case of clean water and electricity generation in the case of clean heat. As a result, Vermont has wastewater facilities that contribute less than 5% of the annual phosphorus pollution loads to Lake Champlain and one of the cleanest energy portfolios in the country. In both cases, we also now need to do what I see as the much, much harder work of non-point source reduction, including things like stormwater runoff and greenhouse gas emissions from homes and businesses. And that work requires tens of thousands of modest projects and direct engagement with tens of thousands of Vermonters. A lot of little p political will um, that can only be built through thoughtful public engagement. And then the final parallel I would point to in both cases is that we have to reckon with the fact that there are real and significant upfront costs and that time will pass between when the investments are made and when the benefits accrue. Uh, just like storm, a stormwater management project built this fall won't lead directly to fewer algal blooms in Lake Champlain next summer, the upfront costs to install a heat pump will not be fully recouped in immediate energy savings, and we need to be honest about that. I recognize this is a very long build up to the question you asked Senator yeah. Ray <laughs> <laughs> to explain the governor's veto message. Um, and administration concerns around H715, um, but hope that you value the context I'm trying to provide. In his veto message, the governor noted a shared obligation with the legislature to ensure Vermonters know the financial costs and impacts of this policy on their lives in the state's economy. And he echoed concerns identified by the Joint Fiscal Office that it is too soon to estimate the impact of the clean heat standard on Vermont's economy, households, and businesses but that the incentives and subsidies needed to implement a clean heat standard could be costly for the state and suggest larger fiscal impacts in future years. The governor also highlighted that there was an in inadequate check back with legislators on such a major policy that lacked important details as it was being passed. Uh, I have done a, at least an initial review of S5 and unfortunately it does not appear these concerns have been addressed. Uh, while S5 pauses the rulemaking process from January to June of 2025, it does not explicitly obligate the legislature to act to affirm or advance the commission's work. And the provisions of 715 that directed the commission to recommend cost containment mechanisms to the General Assembly for possible inclusion in statute have been eliminated. It's also noteworthy, however, that since the veto of 715, staff from a number of state agencies have been working together to address the unknowns the governor expressed concern over. Um, this summer, as I noted earlier, the agency with support from the Senate Council did develop an RFP and has now contracted with Vermont-based Energy Futures Group to evaluate options for reducing building and thermal emissions that will meet the Global Warming Solutions Act requirements as well as estimate the relative costs and benefits to individual consumers and to Vermont as a whole. And we expect that this work will be completed in mid-2023. More recently, we've been following up on advice from colleagues in other states and staff have begun to compile information on current fuel reporting, which is vital to understanding where fuels are being used and establishing supporting relationships with obligated entities, um, so fuel suppliers envisioned by the clean heat standard. As you probably know, fuel suppliers currently report some information on their sales to the tax department and some information to DMV, but the data is not granular enough to support the types of clean heat requirements envisioned by the clean heat standard. For example, um, they report the volume of dyed fuel sold, but do not make a distinction between dyed fuel being used to power a school bus or dyed fuel being used to power a boiler. The Federal Inflation Reduction Act uh, was also signed into law, oh look, August 2022. I had a date here for that one. Uh, and staff have been working to understand those opportunities um, and responding to requests for information from federal funders. We know the federal IRA monies will help Vermont households reduce their energy costs and cut greenhouse gas emissions, um, but we don't yet have any specifics that allow us to evaluate the benefits and how they'll intersect with something like the Clean Heat Standard. 
I say all of this to make clear that the work needed to reduce emissions from the building and thermal sector envisioned in S5 uh, has not stopped. And we continue to make progress in driving towards the 2030 reductions identified in the Global Warming Solutions Act. As a science-based agency, we are working to gather the data needed to support this work. I hope the discussion this morning creates an opportunity to recenter our conversation on what is needed to support impactful, data-informed, effective and affordable policies and programs consistent with the vision of the Global Warming Solutions Act. And I urge that we not let our desire to do something cause us to overlook or ignore important and very real unknowns, including the data needed to design a program that is complicated and far-reaching. I just end by saying I'm hopeful that there is an opportunity to really dig in with all of you and work together on how we can advance the essential efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the building of thermal space. Thank you very much. There's a lot to digest, a lot to respond to. Um, but let me first, uh, you know, I think one of the challenges we have is, and this is just looking at uh, the record. At the, um, when I went back, I went back and looked at the, uh, the Climate Action Committee, Commission that was formed in 2017, and one of the they, they were asked amongst the many recommendations they considered, what are your top five? One of those is decarbonization. And in part, just for exactly the sectors we're talking about transportation and here to thermal. But that's, you know, six years ago. So um, it's, I think for many people, it's troubling that we haven't made concrete progress, even though that was an identified goal and I think probably a shared goal. Well, and you might say, well, we have made progress. So I'd say maybe I should rephrase that as we've made less progress than I think is merited given the urgent situation we're in. <coughs> so that's, you know, that's kind of a, a troubling context for, uh, I'd say, a lack of action to date. And the legislature's attempt to do this last time led to a veto. So, we're all living under the same requirements to meet global greenhouse gas emission requirements. The, the only question I think that's on the table, from, just from my point of view personally, is what is that pathway? How do we fund define it? And how soon can we get moving on it? You also mentioned data driven work, and uh, I think that's a shared value. And we're, there is so much more data available with each passing year. But I was I read the RFP that um, you were kind enough to share a copy with me uh, earlier in the fall. And there's a section in that request that notes that whoever does this work, um, they should consult uh, a, a number of previous studies. And I, I didn't actually count, but I think there might have been nine prior studies. So I'm feeling like we honestly that we we do have a data rich environment and that the work ahead between now and 2025 when a rule with a final rule be developed will have an ample opportunity for more information to flow into it, more data to be gathered and analyzed as part of the process so you know, for anyone listening i think i just want to make sure that people know um, some folks have characterized it as working blindly and i think uh, no one sees the future perfectly, but I think the agency and the legislature and the many studies we've already been asked for and gathered and looked at um, help us. We do have a lot of data to build on. So then the last thing, and we'll go to committee questions after is, so for the California Air Resources Board, like the clean, advanced clean car and truck rule that went through, there was an economic impact analysis that was part of that it was quite robust and i think you also went out to bid to help get that data so i'm uh, this is a very genuine question i'm not sure what you're seeing in uh, s5 which has a, a robust process at the pc the rulemaking why the under the apa there's a requirement to do that kind of impact analysis so uh, why it seems to me like it was sufficient to move 
the advanced and car rule. I didn't. I never heard any concerns expressed that there was inadequate analysis. We shouldn't be doing that. Um, maybe I missed it. Um, I'm thinking that we're using the same process, rulemaking, which includes the economic impact analysis. Why would it? Why is it being prejudged as insufficient to help us make wise decisions, uh, data-driven decisions in the design of you know, what would be in the, the form of the I I think you know what. Okay. That it's most foundational, and I'm happy to, to follow up with some sure. more detailed thoughts. Um, is that the the California Clean Car and Clean Truck rules have been a version has been in place and being worked on since I believe 1977. So we have the benefit of 45 years of action and activity and analysis in this space. Uh, this is a novel approach that is being contemplated here, um, and we don't have the kinds of existing information and data sets that are routinely pulled into something like the clean car and clean truck analysis to support um, the informed development of a clean heat standard at this point. Uh, it was eye-opening for staff at A&R even when they spoke with um, folks in Oregon in particular who um, indicated they couldn't believe that we intended to move forward with a clean heat standard, absent fuel data reporting, and sort of getting our arms around the universe of obligated entities. They indicated that they've been collecting that data for a period of years at this point, and only feel like now that they're well positioned to be able to move forward. Um, these aren't uh, necessarily people that the state has a, a relationship with, unlike um, through the California Clean Car and Clean Truck Standards, where there has been a long-standing and well-understood relationship with the vehicle manufacturers. So one thing, just very quick note, and I go to others, thank you for your patience. Um, the, so to the extent that you see um, shortcomings in the process we're envisioning, I would, because you do have, your agency has deep experience in these areas, we've been rulemaking with A&R more than any other committee, and maybe A&R has more rules than almost everybody else. Um, yes. We would, uh, when we have a chance to follow up, we'll go set time in the future. We, I think it will be helpful to the committee to hear your recommendations so that um, as we look at the bill and develop it, we might improve the data provisions in that bill. Absolutely. So, Just so. know that I, I feel a strong obligation in raising a concern to also offer a solution and have that staff to start to put together what that could look like. Great, thank you. Uh, Senator White and then Senator Watson. Uh, just a quick one, you just noticed you spoke to folks in Oregon. Whom did you speak to? I'd have to get that information from Jane. I personally did not request any love, conversation. I'd love to follow up sure. with um, that. Uh, and then I think what troubles me most about this conversation is I'm not clear on what the vision is for the thermal sector in 20 years that you're articulating and i'm wondering if you could articulate that sure um i don't know maybe it's easier to focus on 20. i would prefer if we could focus on in the next 20 years just because of the the we do have goals in 2020 and uh in 2025 and 2030 as well okay also that's the next seven years right like i'm just trying to make sure i'm answering the question you're you're asking so the near-term component of it um, I think continuing to emphasize weatherization and other foundational practices that are essential to achieving our long-term electrification, including home electric panel upgrades, are need to, to continue to be an area of emphasis. Uh, of that $250 million in federal funding, $80 million of it to go into weatherization. Um, an additional 20 million or more has gone into to, uh, electrical panel upgrades. And we know that that's going to be a limiting factor for many Vermonters in being able to actually install heat pumps or charge an electric vehicle at their home. Um, so that it's, uh, and then ultimately continuing to support the adoption of, of heat pumps and heat pump hot water heaters. I, I don't think that there's a lot of questions about the types of technologies that are needed. Roll of biofuels, maybe set that aside for a moment, because I know that's an area of debate and concern. Um, 
But beyond that, the, the technology solutions themselves are pretty clear. And it in some ways becomes an order of operations question in order to achieve. And if you look at the numbers from the, um, the presentation earlier, in order to achieve the numbers of, of heat pumps that need to be installed, odds are we're going to be installing heat pumps in homes that may not have been weatherized yet. You know, ultimately we said we need 240, whatever, a thousand Vermont homes uh, with that to be weatherized, um, but there's no guarantee that the 69,000 we're trying to weatherize by 2025 and 120,000 we're trying to weatherize um, by 2030 would be a perfect match. Uh, well, or not a perfect match with 96,000 heat pumps installed and 177,000 heat pumps installed respectively in those two years. So inevitably we're going to be installing heat pumps in homes that haven't been weatherized yet in order to achieve these goals um, that may ultimately need to be weatherized and it may not be an efficient or effective approach. And that's where that timeline piece comes in and can be challenging. Okay. 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 Sure, Watson. Uh, so something that you mentioned in your statement and that came up uh, again in the, this conversation uh, is fuel data reporting. So are you suggesting that the administration would be supportive of fuel data or granular fuel data reporting? I would say there's a tiny bit of devil in the details in that we haven't said exactly how that determined exactly how that information would be collected. I would say the governor is aware of the gap um, and has asked us to, to identify strategies for filling it. So okay. I'm gonna go. So, I, I will. Yes. So yes. Okay. Um, and you. Uh, so in identifying strategies, I mean that that's something that we haven't really talked about is identifying strategies about fuel. Correct. And that, yeah, that was what I was saying with Senator Bray. Like I know raising that is a problem. I also need to come to you with a solution. Yeah. We're just not quite there yet. So staff has been meeting with tax department where some of this data is collected and also DMV. And, sorry. Oh no. And it, there's just there are some information sharing issues with the tax department. I think they have fairly strict limits on what they're able to provide outside of tax. That's not aggregate data. So we've been working through those with them as well. And that will absolutely be part of whatever proposal we would bring forward. And is that part? Sorry, is that a part of the recommendations that you anticipate bringing? Oh, uh, yeah, what's the timeline on a recommendation for that? In my ideal world, I would have had that available this morning, uh, but we're we're getting very, we're very close. So like any time now? So, okay, that is super interesting. And then I, uh, so I just want to, uh, say that it is like a, <clears throat> I understand the need for data. We don't, I, I also, and like having robust data, I, I just want to recognize that like, we don't have time, you know, 2030 is on the and the two timelines that you mentioned were 20 years and 40 years, right, for the clean cars and trucks, getting 40 years worth of data before we make a policy. But it's not what I'm advocating okay. for. I'm just saying that's why we are able to, to do some of this work in very short order for clean cars and clean trucks. Right, because there's 40 years worth of data. Correct. Right. It allowed us to move unbelievably expeditiously, right? That we went from we went through that rule making process in less than six months. Thank you. Any other great questions, uh, I was just wondering if you could define what the veto letter describes as a carbon tax. You yes, share your copy. Here, yeah. It says, one of the quotes is, however, over the last several months, it became very clear to me that no one had a good handle on what this program was going to look like, with some even describing it as a carbon tax on the floor. What is the definition of the administration for a carbon tax? Uh, in this instance, I think it would be the equivalent of, of an uh, addition to the price on fossil fuels uh, that would be sold in the state of Vermont. Somewhere fuel service providers are going to have to recover the cost of installing these measures um, and anticipate that it would come 
in all likelihood through the mechanism available to them, which is to increase the cost of the product they're delivering. Um, so with that sort of broader definition, I wouldn't call that a tax, but I mean, does that mean that the energy efficiency charge on our electric bills is a tax? Yeah. I've never heard it described as that. Was it my word choice, so? <laughs> Yeah, just uh, so again at McNamara, after 20 years in energy, uh, every year I heard the energy efficiency charge described as a tax by some people. I'm not saying the Department of Public Service ever called it that, the UC never called it that, but it is a common terminology that I've heard many times. I don't agree with characterization, but I'm just saying it's fairly common usage out there. Well, since we're in lawmaking, we're going to try to be really precise. I know that the agency is very precise as well. Um, there is one other part of uh, you know, a concern that the, the program is characterized as unaffordable. And, well, I, honestly, if we don't know one of the problems we have right now is an inability to express what it will cost because we haven't done enough analysis. I don't know how it can be characterized as too expensive without having had a, a similar analysis performed by somebody so that that would be uh, a data-driven characterization of last year's bill. So I think we do have information to estimate the total cost, not necessarily the, the cost to the individuals, recognizing the bill goes to significant lengths to take in considerations regarding low and mid middle income individuals. Um, but we know how many widgets yeah. we need. We know how much weatherization, we know how much how many heat pumps are needed to be installed. And if you use sort of average prices that came out of a report produced by public service, it totals over $2 billion to achieve the 2030 requirement. So, and that's not the administrative costs of whatever it would take from the PUC, public service, and potentially even a &R to administer a clean heat standard. That's just the raw costs of the infrastructure. Yeah, I think you know the other thing is we talked a lot this morning about large tranches of federal money arriving to help us do so. So there is a timely aspect in terms of uh, taking advantage of those monies to help reduce that cost because we'll have federal support. The other thing that we're thinking about is, but we know that federal money, or imagine that federal money ceases to arrive, and, and so right. then we're trying to stand up a program that has those funds. Uh, uh, are no longer available to us, and we have a program that can be self sustaining over the long term. And I would point to you know, you're talking about clean water work, which is a long term investment. I would reflect that we've made a similar effort in the state on our energy efficiency charge dollars going into efficiency Vermont, where 20, 2000 to 2020. The total dollars collected was $709 million. The lifetime savings by making that investment was $28 billion. So we know it takes money to save money. And I think what we're one of the things we're trying to do is put ourselves on a pathway to invest wisely so that we will save money over time. But we're also not pretending that there's no upfront cost to stepping up and getting it going. The question is, at what pace can we move? Uh, and we're going to get requirements. So I'm sharing all that not to debate, but just to say these are things that we're looking at and thinking about, and it's helped me and it's guiding our work on this bill. We look forward to hearing more from the administration in the coming weeks um, so that we can look for opportunities to address any area of the bill where you feel like there's a shortcoming. Full well acknowledging that you, that the administration may not, you know, uh, Fully support our work in the end, but we're not predetermining things any, any which way. But we do want to understand concerns so that we have the opportunity to get through with you. Um, and thank you for staying. I, I, I apologize. Ten minutes ago. Um, so <laughs> thank you, Secretary Moore. We'll let's stay in touch. Yeah. We really appreciate yeah. your yeah. coming in and spending so much time with us this morning. Absolutely happy to make myself available. Um, okay. Drive safe. Thanks. <laughs> Fortunately, I don't have far to go to get up to that. Right.
So um, thank you so much, Committee, for 